Live on YouTube. We ought to have a Saturday Night Live kind of intro. <laughs> Some music, you know. A loon call. Live from... live. Yep. Mark, you should play a little banjo to bring us in. You know, as if this is a, like a real... You know, thing. I... Too bad we didn't think about it. If, if I knew who was on the other end, I'd be more than happy okay. to do that. <laughs> Yeah, this may not be the place for me to make my YouTube debut. Okay. <laughs> I think Caroline may have frozen again. <laughs> I think Caroline is frozen. Yeah, that happened before oh, you got on. Am I, am I back now? Uh, your image is frozen. Yeah, shoot, I might have to end my video. Huh. Oh. So you can still hear me? You just can't. I can hear you just fine, yeah. but See me? At the moment, yes. all okay. I see is Loon Preservation Committee. I might have to leave my, <laughs> oh, I guess I should change that to, to be just my name. Did Great, you well, so I have been having some internet connection. Yeah, it's hooked up, so I'm a little bit surprised that I'm, I'm cutting out still. I'm not sure yeah, why, but the show on. must go on, I guess. That's so. right, we'll carry on. Yeah, so we are live now, um, so. <laughs> Harry, I don't know, since I I'm not visible, do you want to do the uh, the intro? Um, boy, Caroline, I, I would um, I had nothing prepared um, either <laughs> than uh, than to, to um, you know, say welcome to our um, to our question and answer uh, period. It's my understanding that Caroline has all, has already received several questions from folks. Um, and uh, and uh, obviously people are free to ask other questions as they come in. Um, and I'm really happy to have Mark Pokras here joining Caroline and, and I, because um, Mark is, as we know, um, he is he is a, a virtual uh, additional staff member <laughs> at Loon Preservation Committee for all of the uh, work that he has done on behalf of, of Loons and in helping Loon Preservation Committee um, over the years. And he's definitely the go-to person if we have any questions about Loon health issues and, and Loon um, causes of mortality. I mean, and things, and, and so really happy. Thank you, Mark, for joining us. Um, on, happy on to be here. Talk. Sure. Um, and Caroline, you need no introduction at, at this point, but I'll introduce you anyway as our outreach and volunteer um, biologist and, um, and, and recently, um, you know, increased to uh, full-time status, which was an incredibly necessary thing for the Loon Preservation Committee. Um, and this is just an indication of the fact that we know the importance of education we know the importance of our volunteers and we value those volunteers. So Caroline is, is here to help us with all of those things and to maximize the usefulness and find the synergies and all of that stuff to encourage the continued recovery of our loon population. Caroline, how did I do? You did great. Um, yeah. I guess I would just add that this is the last talk in our series of winter slash spring loon talks. Um, so we're taking the month of June off and then we will be back again in July with our summer nature talk series, which will be weekly throughout the months of July and August. Um, so we will be announcing the topics of those talks in, you know, probably next month's newsletter. So keep your eye out for that. Keep your eye on our social media channels just to learn more about those talks. Um, but I think for now we can probably jump right into the topic of this talk, which is a common loon Q and A. And as Harry said, we did receive some questions in advance through email. So I think we might wanna start with some of those just as we wait for more people to join us and to start asking uh, live questions in the chat. Um, and so I think um, we'll start with a question for you, Mark, if that works. Um, this sure. is a question that came in from one of our volunteers who lives on a lake where uh, last year they had a loon die and the cause of death ended up being aspergillosis. Um, mm -hmm. And so this is sort of a multi-part question all about Asper. What is it? Um, how does it kill loons? How long does it take for Asper to kill loons? And where do they get it? Where is this coming from? Okay, well, before I <coughs> wax poetic over um, on this, I, Carolyn, you should give me a little idea about how much in depth and how long you want me to go on this because you know me, once I get started <laughs> talking on a topic, this could be the next hour. Um, I also, as I, I told you earlier, I, I did put together some PowerPoint pictures that aren't mm -hmm. too gross. 
Um, and so if you if if I've got screen control, if that would be helpful, I can show a couple of pictures. But yeah, let I me just get, yeah, let me just give you some background. When you talk about aspergillosis, aspergillosis is a kind of fungus, it's a kind of mold. And so any of you who have, you know, seen moldy bread in a bag or moldy cheese in the refrigerator or something like that, that's what it looks like. It looks like you know, mold growing on something. And, you know, there's a long history of medical literature, both veterinary literature and human literature about mold diseases, fungal diseases in animals, including people. And what we usually associate fungal diseases with is somebody whose immune system isn't working properly. So people, we think about people on cancer chemotherapy or immunosuppressive drugs or who have infectious diseases that depress their immune system, they're more susceptible to fungal diseases. With loons in the wild, we don't know why they're getting it. We don't have any evidence at this point that there's something directly affecting their immune disease, but that's one of the big research questions that many people, I mean, LPC and other biologists around the country are looking at is are some of the things going on in the environment, whether it's chemicals or stress or other kinds of things, are they affecting the bird's immune system so that the birds get fungal disease? Um, and I think Carolyn, one of the questions you ask is where does it come from? Um, and <laughs> it's, it's scary, but it's sort of interesting and real. It's everywhere. I mean, if I were to take this air right here in the room that I'm sitting in and take it into the lab and put it on a microscopic plate to grow fungal spores, I would grow aspergillus. I would grow a, the, the organism that causes aspergillosis. I am 100% sure. You have breathed it in, the spores in every day of your life, but we've evolved with it. It's, it was on Earth long before humans came along. And so our immune systems handle it on a regular basis, just like we handle everything else, as long as our immune systems are working well. So it's pretty much every place, but think about mold now. Think about moldy bread or moldy cheese or mold on the wall in a damp basement. And that was the key, damp, okay? Mold in general doesn't grow well where it's hot and dry. So if it's hot and moist, most molds grow better. And again, one of the things that we're facing in this world is we're facing climate change. Rainfall patterns are changing, um, wetter in some areas, drier in other areas, the world is getting warmer. And in the health arena, when we talk to doctors and veterinarians, people are more concerned that we may start to see more fungal diseases. And there's many, many, many other fungal diseases. Aspergillosis that we see in, in loons is just one kind. So it's in the environment, it's every place. It grows better when it's warm and wet, like many molds do. Um, but we don't exactly know why loons are getting it. It does appear that loons are getting it more now than they were 30 years ago when we started looking at causes of death in New Hampshire. So something is changing and we don't know what yet. So if I've got screen control, let me just show you a few quick pictures. Um, oh, I do. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. Cool. All right. So let me do the slide thing. So what you're seeing here, the blue thing with all the dots, if you look at aspergillosis under a microscope, that's what it looks like. Almost like little paint brushes or something like that. And every one of those little dots up there is a spore that flies off into the air and can grow new fungi. And there are many different kinds of aspergillosis. And so here's a dead loon from New Hampshire. Actually, this one's from Maine. I'm, I'm reading the tag on it now. But what we see in these birds that die is the fungus is in their respiratory system. It's in their lungs. And because birds have air sacs as part of how they breathe, it's in their air sacs. And so if you look in this air sac here, what do you see? You look, you see something that looks like mold on bread. You don't want that in your lungs and air sacs <laughs> um, for two reasons. I mean, one is it, it impedes breathing. It gets in the way of breathing. 
The animal just can't breathe properly. And the other one is many fungi also produce toxins. So that's, that's why this bird is dead. We don't know why it got the aspergillosis, but we know that the aspergillosis is what killed it. Um, and so there's lots of different signs associated with aspergillosis, but the biggest one that you usually see is difficulty with breathing and lethargy. They're just, they look sick. You know, they're up on the shore, they're gasping for breath. They're, um, they're just not doing well. So lots of different signs. And that's, that's aspergillosis. We see acute forms. We can talk about this more if you want to get into depth, depth on it. We see more chronic, slow growing forms. Probably depends on how well the bird's immune system is working and on the dose of spores they receive. And here it is on x-ray. This is an x-ray of a loon. And what those red arrows are pointing to is thick air sacs. You shouldn't normally be able to see an air sac on an x-ray, but the fact you can see those little white lines by the red arrows means there's something thick, abnormal in those air sacs. I can't tell that it's aspergillosis from the x-ray, but I can tell there's something wrong with that bird's respiratory system. And there's another close-up one, that curved white line that you're seeing there is a very thick and very nasty looking air sac from aspergillosis. And so that's probably enough on aspergillosis at the moment. Any questions or things you want to go into further? Um, one thing I did want to bring up, Mark, because it's something that I heard you talk about a little bit at Nelswig and yes. um, you know some other recent meetings, um, is how the materials that we use for loon nest wraps can sometimes right. harbor this. And so, and Carol, particularly I'm, I'm so, if you use straw. I'm, so glad that you brought that up, but it's not nest wraps, it's a, and it's not just loons, it's a lot of things. Remember what we said earlier about there's spores everywhere and what's it growing on? It's growing on where things are moist, where things are warm, and it's, off, and it's often growing on plant material, decomposing plant material. And so <clears throat> we learned years ago, 50 years ago, with oil spills and trying to rescue birds from oil spills, if you take birds that are stressed from an oil spill and you put them on straw or hay or hardwood wood chips or something like that, all the birds are gonna die of aspergillosis. That plant material has so many spores of the fungus in it that the birds, particularly the birds that are immunosuppressed will get a big dose and they're gonna die very rapidly. It's a quick way to kill stressed birds is to put them on straw. And so, you know, this is one of those things we talk to veterinary students about or with zoos or things like that. You never, ever, ever, in capital letters under any circumstances, put birds on material like that. Um, you know, peng you can kill penguins in zoos, you can kill turkeys in a, a stressed, dense farm situation, and you can certainly kill loons. Um, so we want to avoid those materials at all costs. You know, live plants are good. Um, things like green evergreen boughs. Um, the thing about evergreen boughs is that they're very acid. They're very low pH. They don't tend to grow fungus very well. Um, mm -hmm. And so for short-term kinds of things, they can be useful. But in general, we stay away from plant materials altogether. And we use, um, you know, uh, towels and things like that for padding when we're transporting a loon. I'd never put a loon in a carrier with straw, even to transport if we had rescued one. It, mm -hmm. That would probably kill it just from the uh, aspergillosis exposure. Um, and so if we're building nest rafts and things like that, um, and you've probably all seen pictures on the LPC website, they tend to use live plantings um, and they tend to use the local native marsh grasses and things like that. Um, so no hay, no straw, nothing of that nature. We can stay far away from it. Yeah, yeah. And the other Good reason question. that, um, and sort of uh, taking a little bit of a turn from there, but the other reason that we don't use straws that we've noticed, um, at least here in New Hampshire, that we tended to have bigger black fly problems on nests that had straw oh. for whatever reason, maybe it was harboring them, I'm not totally sure, but that's also, Isn't you know, in addition so to- Huh. 
Yeah. That's, I have no explanation, but I'm fascinated <laughs> by, by your observation. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, huh. you know, not something that I don't think was, you know, studied super intensively, but just, you know, was based on a lot of different um, observations yeah. from different lakes. So uh, that's another part of the reason that we tend to stick to uh, dirt and mud and ve vegetation that's alive. Um, yeah. Harry and Mark, thank you so much for that question. I think uh, yeah. you you covered it at a great level that wasn't too technical, but you know, got got the message across. Um, Harry, I've heard you give a really great answer to this next question in uh, other presentations, and so I'm going to throw this one to you. Um, it's how do we watch loons during the nesting phase without disturbing them, and how can you know when a loon that you're watching is agitated and you should give it some more space? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, um, boy, this is a great question, Caroline, and it, and it really is pretty central and it gets to the core, you know, of, of um, loons. Oh, boy, that, that sun is just coming in right now. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, uh, you know, often when I give talks, I, I, I will say, you know, in order to really help loons thrive in New Hampshire, um, if we pro it probably if we did just two things, you know, we could really help out loons. One is don't use lead sinkers and, and jigs. And, and Mark and, um, and Caroline, you can both speak to great depth and, and length at, uh, at that because it's really just not uh, something that it is at all compatible with, uh, with loon life or, or uh, other aquatic life as, as well. But the other thing is just to give these birds some space. And, and so um, I've often said, you know, if you want to get close to a pair of, of loons on the water or a loon on the nest, there's really only one way to do that, and that's with a good pair of binoculars. And, and so um, one of the issues, of course, is that, and this, this is especially true if there's a loon on the nest and you, and you come across this bird, um, or if you have loons with little chicks, because we all want to, you know, the first thing that happens when we see these little chicks on the water um, it's something new. It's incredibly exciting. We all want to get a little bit closer to that pair and experience that wonderful moment of having an intimate, you know, look into the life of, of a loon. And the problem is, um, as we try and get closer to these birds to have that experience, eventually we get to a point where we're impacting that bird. And, and so um, at, at a certain point, the loons stop what they're doing, which is what they need to be doing, which is feeding for the feeding those chicks, um, preening themselves, you know, protecting those those little chicks from from predators or or keeping an eye out for eagles overhead, and they begin to focus their attention on us instead as potential predators that are intruding on their little loon family. And so uh, and so, what happens at that point is they stop doing those behaviors that they need to be doing, which is the reason why we're trying to observe these birds in the first place. And and now they're reacting to us, you know. And they may and they may, they first of all they stop doing what they're doing. But if we continue to come closer, then what loons will do is they'll turn and they'll swim away, right? And they're, and they're attempting essentially to put a little bit of distance between themselves and and us, which again these birds are viewing as perhaps a potential threat. Um, and so unfortunately, sometimes what do people do? Well, they paddle a little bit harder, right? To get up back up close to these birds. And I've actually seen um, in a couple of, in some cases, you know, you can see a pair of loons that it's just doing, it's being pursued, right? By a, a person in a canoe or a kayak and they're just doing these slow circuits um, around the, the lake. Um, and the unfortunate thing, and sometimes you'll see somebody, you know, with a little iPhone or something and they wanna take a picture. And you, and you know, they don't have good lenses. There's not a good telephoto. So if they wanna get something that looks, you know, neat and fills up the screen on their iPhones, they have to get, you know, really, really close to these birds again. And, and either one of those things is really just not good for a, a loon family. And this is really important because um, there's an aspect of loon biology, which, which is that loons um, tend to not hatch um, simultaneously. And so a first loon chick usually hatches within a day, give or take, of, of uh, earlier than that second loon. And what that means is that that first loon is on the water and it's getting fed, it's getting fish stuffed into it the entire time that other adult is still incubating that second chick. So by the time that second chick hatches, that first chick has had a day's head start. So it's gonna be the dominant of those two chicks. Um, and the parents, you know, really don't play favorites with the loon chicks. They simply feed the first one that gets to them, but that chick, the dominant chick is gonna make sure that it's the first one that gets to them. Uh, and only once that chick has had its fill, does that second chick, you know, begin to get fish stuffed into it. 
Um, and so this can be really important because in, in some cases, we have loon families that are on lakes with abundant fish supplies, but we often find the second chick of that two chick brood starts and it doesn't you know, make it to, to become a juvenile loon and then, and then uh, end up fledging off of that lake. And I really do think that sometimes it's because there's just enough human disturbance that's impacting that natural, that natural stuff that these loons have to do that that second chick is not getting enough food um, and, and it's eventually you know, losing body condition. That makes it even less able to compete with its older sibling and the inevitable result is just a slow decline um, and then unfortunately death to these loons. And, and so it really is important and, and one of the most important um, things that we can leave uh, people with, I think if we're talking about human interactions with loons is to give these birds some space. And that includes, um, you know, especially loons with young chicks um, and especially loons that are on the nest because when a loon is on the nest, that's when it is extremely vulnerable. And loons recognize that. And, and so if you approach a nest too closely, you can easily flush that bird off of the nest. Um, and if you turn around, and um, I have done this accidentally, you know, because as we're searching the shoreline for loons, you come around the corner, all of a sudden there's a loon, you know, on, on the nest and you're surprised and the loon is surprised and the loon flushes off the nest. The good news is if you turn around and leave that area right away, the chances are pretty good that that loon is going to come back onto the nest and, you know, in 20 or 30 minutes and get back on. The danger is that if it's a really hot day, those loons can cook on the nest. If it's a cold and rainy day, they can chill. Either one of those can kill the embryo that's developing inside of that loon egg. And it also leaves those uncovered eggs um, vulnerable, you know, to any predators who are flying over or are working their way along the shoreline looking for an easy way, right? And the, there's an abundance of, of animals that will take a loon egg if they can get it, if they come across an untended nest. Uh, and that includes raccoons and, and mink, which are probably the most common mammalian predators mm -hmm. of untended loon eggs. Uh, but it can also include, you know, a, um, a possum, um, you know, a fox, a, a bear, a coyote, you know, any of these scavenging animals um, and, and uh, anything that's flying overhead, you know, the, and the prime suspects there are eagles and crows and, and gulls uh, and ravens. So it's, it's very important that we give these birds some space because we can have very obvious and dramatic consequences of that, but then we can also have these consequences that aren't evident right away, but we've impacted that animal. Uh, and I remember my, my, the person who I think explained this best was Judy Silverberg, who is now retired, but an educator at New Hampshire Fish and Game. Uh, and she said, whenever you have caused a wild animal to change its behavior, you have made an, imp you have impacted that animal. Um, and so the thing that we need to do is, is stay outside of that zone um, and let these birds kind of do their thing. And loons will, will communicate, you know, distress in many different ways. It can be as subtle in loons as kind of raising the, um, uh, the crest on their, on their head. And so um, you, if you have kind of a square brow, so it almost looks like more of a baseball cap, um, you know, uh, on the front end of that loon, that's a pretty mild um, form. It's kind of, you know, it may be akin to raising an eyebrow, you know, for us as, as humans, but from there it can actually progress um, to either floating very low in the water or being very upright and, um, and, and alert in the water to making any sort of a vocalization, you know, which can be an indication of distress to moving away. And so if you're observing any of those things, that's really a loon telling you that you are too close to, to that bird. Uh, and very importantly, if a loon is on the nest, um, normally a loon on the nest has its head up and it's just kind of looking around. And the minute that loon cranes its head flat across the nest, um, that's a sign of distress, you know? So from that, that's meant to kind of lower the profile of that bird, make it less conspicuous on the nest and hopefully avoid detection by anything that's coming close to the nest. And from that posture, it's also very easy for a loon to explode off of that nest if it feels like it's in, it's in mortal danger uh, from the close approach of, of uh, humans or any other uh, potential predator. Yeah, and I would just add that um, on our website, which is loon.org, we do have a section about loons. And, and within that section, we have uh, a page about loon behavior where you can see photos or videos of a lot of the behaviors that Harry just mm -hmm. described. Um, we often get calls from people who are seeing a loon in hangover position 
in the summer and, and they call us and they say, I think this loon is dead on the nest. You have to come collect it. And we tell them just back away a little bit and they do, but you know, they realize that head pops right back up. Um, yeah, so, so there are pictures and videos of what all of these different behaviors look like on our website. So you can check that out and um, you know, learn to, to read loon behavior and, and be able to uh, modify your own behavior in response to it. Yeah. Great. Um, so at the beginning of that answer, Harry, you mentioned and lead, and that uh, leads really nicely into a question that we received in advance. Um, this one I'm going to direct towards Mark initially, but I think any of us probably could jump in at any point. Um, so the question is, you know, lead poisoning is a big problem for loons. We know that we've established that, but the, uh, the question is a little bit more technical and how exactly does lead poisoning kill a loon? Um, and then there's also a part two, which is, okay, we can't use lead sinkers and jigs anymore because it will kill a loon, but are there other metals or materials that we should be avoiding or, um, you know, as long as it's not lead, is it okay? Okay, all good questions. And <clears throat> again, you know, there's always the, the issue about how deep to go into some of the, the science parts of things. Um, because in fact, the first question you ask about how lead kills a loon, uh, there are books <laughs> um, on you know the molecular mechanisms of lead pathology and things like that. And I understand most of the chemistry, but not necessarily all of it. But basically, if you think about lead, lead is a metal. And so if you think about the periodic table, there's a group of metals, um, lead and iron and cadmium and things of that nature. But another metal that's very close to lead on the periodic table and similar, similar in terms of chemistry is actually calcium, which we all know is essential in our diets and for building bones and it's an important nutrient and things like that. And so most of the problems that we see with lead poisoning, calcium is essential, lead is not essential to any living thing that we know about but lead mimics calcium in the body. It goes into some of these biochemical reactions and actually displaces calcium, pushes it out of the way. And so we see it, you know, if you ask any, you know, chemistry student, biochemistry student, medical student, something like that, what does calcium do in the body? the list is endless. Calcium is one of the most essential minerals in the body, not just for building bones, but for instance, for sending signals along nerves. You can't send a signal along a nerve without calcium um, and ion channels and all this kind of thing. And so lead interferes with all of that stuff. Um, lead interferes with the beating of the heart. It interferes with nerves transmitting signals around the body, including in the brain. Um, and one of the most obvious things we see, um, and this goes back, this has been known in the human medical literature since a guy named Tancarel de Planche wrote a book in 1848 in France, and I've got a copy on my shelf. Um, but basically, one of the main nerves in your body, it, um, part of the central nervous system, it's called the vagus nerve, V-A-G-U-S, goes from the brain down to all of your insides. It goes to the heart, it goes to the intestines, it goes to everything else. And lead affects the nerve signals from that nerve early on. It doesn't take much lead to affect what's called the vagal nucleus of the brain. And one of the first things that we see and was described in people as far back as the ancient Greeks was something that was called painter's colic people who were using paints that contain lead, um, whether they were artists or house painters or anything else, would come down with terrible abdominal pains. Um, just for those of you who have horses, you know what colic is. For those of you who have babies, you know what colic is. But basically the intestines start grinding and folding up on themselves and contracting abnormally. And it is exquisitely painful. And that's one of the things that's caused by lead is um, colic of the intestines. And it means the food doesn't move through in the proper sequence. In birds of prey like hawks and eagles and owls, it cast pellets back up. It means they can't cast pellets back up. And so A, it's painful. B, it means the, the digestive tract isn't working the way it's supposed to. Food isn't moving through improperly. 
And so we see different signs in different species. What we often see in waterfowl, geese and ducks and swans, is impaction. They're hungry and they keep eating and they fill themselves up with food, but it can't go anywhere because the intestines aren't contracting properly. And so they die of starvation with a full crop and esophagus of food because the food can't go anyplace. Um, and so what we're seeing in loons oftentimes and um, what we see depends on a couple of different things. You know, what's the dose of lead that the animal got? Is it a little, little bit over a long period of time? Is it chronic? We don't see that in loons very much. What we tend to see in loons is acute poisoning. You know, a healthy loon ingests a big lump of lead. They get a big dose at a time. And so as Harry and Carolyn know, and I'm sure it's on the LPC website, what we often find is either the birds are dead on shore, um, they died quickly, or they're feeling so lousy and they're having respiratory problems. It's almost like the aspergillosis we talked about before. They start open mouth breathing, they start panting, their hearts and their lungs aren't working properly, but it's not because there's fungus in the way like of aspergillosis. It's because the nerve transmission isn't working the way it's supposed to. And so these birds tend to come up on shore and they droop their heads and they droop their wings and their eyelids droop. And sometimes if their beaks droop in the water, they drown. Um, and sometimes they just lie there on shore, virtually helpless to do anything to protect themselves. And you can go up and pick them up and put them in a box. And, and there's nothing you're gonna see on the outside that says, ah, oh, that animal's got lead poisoning. It's, you know, weak, aren't doing right birds. It could be lead, it could be aspergillosis, it could be other kinds of things presenting in much the same way. And so this is why, you know, LPC and some of the rehabilitators they work with try and rescue these birds get them to a veterinarian, check the blood for lead, take an x-ray to see if there's any lead in there. But, you know, loons are tough birds. They don't tend to co come up weak on shore until they're pretty badly debilitated. And so the success in rescuing loons that have acute lead poisoning is pretty poor. Um, an awful lot of those animals don't survive to be re-released. And so the earlier we can tell that a loon's not doing well and rescue it, the better the chance we have of doing something. Um, so we've got acute lead poisoning that we usually see in loons. We see chronic low level lead poisoning in many other species. And think about people. You know, we've all seen recently about children in Flint, Michigan from lead in the water. That's not like children dying in the street. It's like children who are going slowly downhill. They're losing learning ability. Um, their body condition is going down because of the lead interfering with all of the nerve transmission and the calcium in their bodies. So we see different things in different species depending on the health of the animal and how much lead they're exposed to. Nasty stuff, but the acute form, as we said, is, is not only you know, deadly, but because of the, the GI effects, it's exquisitely painful to the animal. Hmm. And Mark, what about that, the second part of that question about other, the safe alternatives, ah, and there are alternatives that are not yeah. as safe? I'm, I'm glad you keep reminding me of this. The, all these questions have a second part. Uh, <laughs> let me take the screen back for just a second. Hmm. Um, go back to that PowerPoint, wherever I put it. There it is. All right, so just a quick table here, and this is, from a human textbook, but you can see some of the signs of acute lead poisoning versus chronic lead poisoning. You'll see that the lead is affecting every system in the body. You have kidney problems, you have heart problems, you have nerve problems, you have all kinds of things. Um, but in terms of alternatives, the wonderful thing these days, and Harry will remember, there are tons more non-toxic products on the market than there used to be. It's not hard to find non-toxic things. So let's just look at what's up here. We have tin, we have bismuth, we have steel, we have natural rocks that have swivels on them and are sold commercially as fishing sinkers. And having used them, I can tell you they cast fine. They allow you to catch fish. And if you lose one, it's another rock in the lake. It probably doesn't do any great harm. So in terms of what's safe, you know, 
10 bismuth steel natural rocks that are on the market. These are all known to be safe. There's some things that we're not quite sure about. Um, um, one would be brass. Um, there are brass sinkers um, that are marketed as non-lead sinkers, but brass is a composite metal. Brass is a mixture of uh, copper and tin and of all things lead. Um, mm. And so different batches of brass may have lead in them and, and it may be able to be absorbed by an animal system. So I would not use brass and I would not use copper. You don't want, want to be using putting copper into aquatic systems, not because of loons, but copper is quite toxic to a lot of aquatic organisms, fish and invertebrates. Mm. Think of copper boat paints and things like that. Um, so, and so, as we said, tungsten, bismuth, um, tin, iron, steel, rocks, those are all good. But there's some things on the market that you want to avoid. For instance, there is a sinker made of zinc. Zinc is basically as toxic as lead, but it's packaged saying non-lead sinker. Well, they're right, it's non-lead, but it doesn't mean it's non-toxic. So zinc is a no-no. Another one, and it's not made in this country, but we see them imported a lot, particularly from China, is cadmium sinkers. Mm. Um, again, they're marketed as non-lead fishing gear. It doesn't say cadmium anywhere on the package. Um, but in tiny little print on the back, it says that th these do not conform to the California health standards. Mm. Um, cadmium is more poisonous than lead. <laughs> um, we do not want it in any products going out into the environment or that we get our children attaching to. So you, want, you, do, you don't want a package that just says non-toxic without identifying what metal it is. You want one that tells you what the metal is. Steel, iron, tin, bismuth, all fine. Or again, some of these natural rock sinkers like the Paltrex ones I've got on my slide there. But there's several brands of natural rock sinkers. There's also a couple of companies that are starting to test market ceramic sinkers um, that, that look very good and look non-toxic. So I think, there's going to be more and more and more products available at very reasonable cost. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Mark. Sure. Um, we have a couple questions in the live chat that I think I'll, I'll go through next before we pop back to the pre-submitted ones. Um, so the first is how many rafts has LPC already floated this year? And do you plan to float more? Um, so we've floated, I'd say somewhere around 30 so far. And yes, we absolutely plan to float more. Um, between staff and our volunteers, I think, Harry, we're gonna be over a hundred rafts this year, right? We floated 85 oh, last wow. year. Yeah, and we're adding, you know, 15 to 20 new ones based on need um, this year. And so, wow. yeah, about half of those will be floated by LPC staff, maybe a little more than half. Um, and the rest are floated by our, you know, really dedicated, uh, great band of volunteers that we have working with us here in New Hampshire. Um, so, so far we've floated around 30. We're doing the Winnipesaukee rafts this coming week. We're doing all of our North country rafts this coming week um, up in Pittsburgh, especially where, you know, you've got the Connecticut lakes that are all dammed and experience really, really crazy water level fluctuations throughout the season. We have, um, hmm. How many rafts do we have up there? 20, and we're uh, adding a couple more this year. So we've got uh, some really busy weeks ahead of us before our seasonal staff start up. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then there's another question about the black flies. Um, and so <laughs> some may watching may already know this, but if not, uh, the common loon does have a species of black fly that actually specializes on loons, right? And the timing of that fly's life cycle centers around the nesting period for loons. And so it's not uncommon, especially around this sort of uh, late spring, early summer time to see those net, those loons that are already sitting on nests be totally swarmed. Um, 
and there's uh, a loon cam in Minnesota right now where, you know, they're seeing that right now. The loon is just, you know, it looks, um, <laughs> you, you feel very, very bad for that loon. Oh. Um, and so there's a question that says, uh, I have an idea of how to deal with black flies by spraying the nests before eggs were laid with something non-toxic that could repel the flies. Is this idea being explored by anybody? Um, and I know um, from our Loon Cam chat earlier, uh, people were talking with our Loon Cam operator, Bill, and we're suggesting things like peppermint oil or, or other kinds of oil. Um, now, I'm not aware of, of anyone investigating anything like that, but <laughs> Mark, you're, you're pretty in the know with all the different you know, folks in different areas doing research. So have you heard anything about fly reduction? You know, I have heard people talking about it. I don't know that anybody's actually tried. Okay. Um, uh, there have been some discussions, you know, particularly now in the age of Zoom, um, of things one could do, you know, some of those natural kinds of um, products. The other thing that people have talked about, both in terms of natural nests and in terms of platforms, is plantings. You know, there are some plants that produce either uh, pyrethrins or other natural chemicals that um, repel certain kinds of flying insects. And there might be some work that you could do there. Um, but I don't know that anybody who is doing the work yet. Okay. Um, and then we just got another question that's loon cam related, so I'll answer it real quick. Um, so this question is, Caroline, will you update us on the original pair from Nest Cam 1? And if they nest, will you still put the signs and buoys around? So. Um, for those who don't keep up with our Loon Cams year to year, we changed our Loon Cam one site um, this year for a variety of different reasons. Uh, but you know, people have been watching those loons since 2014, and so uh, a lot of people are pretty attached to that pair. Mm -hmm. So the great news is that uh, our senior biologist John Cooley was at the lake from from the original Loon Cam one just last week, and he saw bands on both loons. Now he only saw one leg mm. per loon, and so. You can't, you know, 100% say, yes, it was definitely these same two loons. But, um, you know, based on the fact that the, the legs match the loons that we expect to be there, we're reasonably, you know, and actually very confident that the same pair has returned again this year, um, which was exciting because the male was rescued last uh, fall after getting into a pretty serious fight with some other loons. So the pair is back, they haven't nested yet, um, but if they do, we will be putting the signs uh, and, and the rope lines around them again, yes. Cool. Yeah, and so yeah. I guess <laughs> um, trying to you know, connect the dots and lead into the next question, I guess that, uh, that male loons fight from last year leads into a great question that we were asked ahead of time, which uh, is about aggression in loons. Um, right, so loons are birds that are very territorial during the breeding season and can and do fight sometimes to the death. Um, and so this, this question is, uh, you know, which loons are fighting? Is it just the males that fight each other? Do females fight too? Um, will a male ever fight a female? Um, and then, you know, along those same lines, do males or females do it more often or more aggressively? Um, are there differences like that between the sexes. Um, and Mark, I know this is something that you've studied in terms of, you know, looking at the sternums of loons that you received to necropsy. So um, maybe if you wanted to start us off and then, you know, Harry or I could chime in with field observations as well. Sure. Yeah, it, it's interesting. And this is one of those areas that the information that I think we have from field observers doesn't completely match the information we have from the post-mortem studies. And so this is what happens in science, that you do different kinds of studies and it just generates more questions that we have to answer. Um, you know, why are these two things different? Um, so, you know, again, just to give everybody some background, I am, you know, as a veterinarian, I've, I think my contribution to this project for many years now has been to investigate the causes of mortality. You know, I don't spend anywhere near as much time out in a canoe with the live loons as, as some of the LPC bio. I mean, I love to do it, but um, I spend more time with the dead ones, taking x-rays and taking them apart and trying to figure out what the problems are. <clears throat> and one of the things we've looked at is we've looked at this issue of wounds in loons that were caused by other loons. 
And it's pretty clear, and I think Carolyn and, and Harry, I sent you some information on that earlier. It's pretty clear that from looking at the post-mortem data, the mortality data, that the boys and the girls are equally aggressive. You know, when we started this out, we were sexy. You know, we figured, oh, it's the boys, it's testosterone. They're the ones that yodel, they're getting into all the fights and that we were gonna see these serious wounds in males only. Well, the statistics are in and the statistics are very clear. The girls fight as often and as fiercely as the males and kill other loons as often as the males do, mm -hmm. which surprised, frankly, the hell out of us. Forgive my French. <laughs> um, um, but one of the questions you ask, we don't know the answer to. And this is where the field biologists need to help us. Uh, do we have males just fighting with males and females just fighting with me females or are there cross gender fatal battle? I don't know the answer to that. I can't tell you from the wounds. Um, and the field observations, well, I'll, I'll let Harry, Harry and Carolyn talk more about that, but I haven't seen anything conclusive from what I've read. And uh, there's a biologist in Wisconsin, Walter Piper, who's done a bunch of work on that. Um, so I don't think we know the answer about cross-gender mm -hmm. fatal fights at this point. It, it's certainly something that we have to look at, but it's curious to me that this period of intense aggression where they actually kill one another and they do it with some frequency is short. You know, it's only from the beginning of the breeding season until maybe what, early to mid August. And then when their hormones start going down, <laughs> when the days start getting longer and they are starting to come out of reproductive condition, they become quite social the birds yeah. become more friendly. You see them assembling into fall flocks and they seem to enjoy spending time with one another whereas six weeks earlier, they literally would have killed one another. Yeah. Um, and so this, it's a very interesting dynamic in the loon world that, that I think people are gonna be studying a lot more in years to come. I don't think we know all the answers there. Sure, yeah. It's and, and it really is interesting, Mark, because for a long time, you know, people we used to say, well, you know, I saw three loons together and they were kind of doing a little circle, uh, you know, slowly circling each other and things. And people always used to think, oh, how nice the loons are getting together. They're having a little coffee clutch, you know, and, and uh, things. And, and of course, the um, I think one of the things that's happening, especially in the early season, is when and when you think about the biology of these birds, it's all about securing a territory you know, and, and, yeah. and being able to mate and to cast those genes into the next generation. And, and so what you've got is you've likely got a mated pair of loons and they're very, and, and it's quite possible that they were mated from like the year previously, many, 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 mm -hmm. many years previously. And, and they arrive back, you know, it, all indications are they've taken separate winter vacations, but they, but they show back up on the, on the lakes, they reunite. Yeah. Um, and they, um, and, and so the, the, uh, the courtship, um, is, is really, you know, nothing dramatic. A lot of times it consists of loons kind of quietly swimming next to each other and cooing. And so that's another reason why, why we think that perhaps this is just a, a reunion rather than, you know, a new kind of a, of a situation that, that, uh, re, that these pairs reform every year. I mean, although sometimes that happens. Um, and then what you have is a number of, of these floater loons. And they're out there, they're, they're looking to secure a territory of their own. Perhaps they're young birds who've never had a territory. Maybe, maybe they're birds that were kicked out of their territory because they lost a territorial battle last year or, or something, but they're prospecting for, for new territories. And so they are gonna visit from lake to lake. Uh, and typically, um, you know, from, from the, the observations of banded loons where we know the individuals and therefore we know the sexes of these individuals as, as well. What will often happen is if it's a female that is looking, that is coming in and intruding into that territory, then the female of that territorial pair will go out to greet it. And if it's a male that's coming in, then the male will go out to greet it because they're the ones that are at mm. risk from being set upon because the, the whole thing of, this, of the, this intruder is looking to oust its counterpart from that territory and secure mm -hmm. that territory for itself. And when it does that, they will typically be accepted, you know, by the remaining uh, member of the pair, and it will reform an, a new pair of uh, as far as that goes. And so you get these 
um, these wing rowings and, and you get these synchronous bill dippings and these circle dances and these ritualized forms of behavior. A lot of them, which are not outright aggression, but they're just kind of displays of strength. And, and so um, if there's a wing rowing or something of that nature or a penguin dance or something of, uh, uh, like that, that's taking a lot of energy. And, and what's happening essentially is that you've got the male or the female of this territorial pair and it's telling this intruding, you know, loon, if you are looking to, you know, if you're thinking that I am old or I'm weak or I'm injured in some way and that you can wrestle this territory away from me, think again, because I'm strong and I could keep up this wing rowing all day and I could keep up this penguin dancing all day and you do not want to pick a fight with me, right? So, that, so they're trying to convince this person or, or this, this intruding loon, right, to keep on going. Like, you know, keep going to the next territory because you're not going to be successful in, in wrestling this territory from me. And what happens, I guess, the, um, uh, where these birds get into trouble, one of the territorial pair is if they have been injured, you know, or if, if they are, ter uh, are um, you know, um, in, in poor health or retired because they've experienced too many battles with other loons, then this intruding loon is going to think that it has a chance um, and, and often, and either then, or when these birds think that they're evenly matched and neither one of them wants to back down, that's probably where we see these territorial battles. Um, and, and that's where we get into the fights. And that can often lead to a serious injury. Sometimes it can even lead to death, you know, by these birds. So it's a pretty fascinating aspect of the biology. And then just as Mark was saying, you know, as the summer goes on, um, these, the, the, the hormone levels are coming down and these birds have either mated and they've, and they've um, raised their chicks to the point where they're so, somewhat self-sufficient or unfortunately they failed, you know, in that nest. And at that point, there's no real reason um, to spend a lot of energy defending a territory. Um, and even the pair bond begins to kind of slowly break down and, and everybody just kind of relaxes a little bit. The stakes are not so high. And so later in the summertime, if there's an intruding loon that comes into that territory, it's no big deal. Um, and as summer wears into fall, you'll see these groupings of three or four loons and they grow into six or eight loons. And then in the, in the fall, later on in the fall, sometimes you can get, you know, a dozen, two dozen loons, you know, at the same, at the same time, which is quite a sight uh, to be able to do. And everybody seems to be getting along um, because at, at this point, they're just putting in time uh, till they go to the ocean and then the next year that cycle starts all over again. Mm -hmm. um, and a really cool thing that someone you know brought up in the comments in the chat um, is that loons are also aggressive towards other species right uh, oh on certain gosh, occasions. Yeah, yeah so this mm -hmm. person has seen a loon chasing a great blue heron. I've seen loons chase you know multiple different species of ducks. I've seen them go after geese. Um, yeah, so that territoriality doesn't extend just to other loons, but it, you know, it crosses species. If they don't want someone else in their area, they're going to let, you know, that, that bird know. Right. Yeah, you're exactly right. And, and again, uh, there's a bunch of literature published on this. Um, and it can extend not to just to chasing the other birds away, but they can be fatal interactions. And so there are papers out there about loons killing geese and loon, loons killing mallards and loons killing mergansers. They seem to have a particular thing for swans. <laughs> um, loons and swans do not coexist well. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there have been some fatal battles reported there. Loons are tough customers, you know? They're and ornery. <laughs> they, well, they're ornery and they've got a real weapon. You know, that beak, as every loon biologist knows, that beak they've got on there, that's a saber and it's sharp and they're strong birds and they know how to use it. Right. Yeah. 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 And I guess this feeds, um, and we don't have to stay on it for too long, but another question that we had received ahead of time was, you know, I'm, I'm seeing these loons do all these big displays out on the lake in front of my house. Is this some sort of uh, mating dance or courtship ritual? Um, and so it's sort of like we've just covered, the answer is no, probably not, right? So courtship right. in loons um, is really subtle. And, you know, they might just be swimming around together. They might be diving mm -hmm. simultaneously or fishing together. So really when you're seeing these big, crazy displays uh, or a lot of splashing with the loons, it's probably a fight and not, uh, not your two pair members bonding or trying to attract right. each other. Right, yeah, more, more territorial than defense than courtship. Mm. Right. Um, and Harry mentioned things like the penguin dance and wing rowing. And again, those are things that we do have videos of on our website in the loon behavior section. If you're interested in 
um, seeing exactly what that looks like. We're getting close to eight. Um, I do wanna to touch on one other question that we received in advance, um, but there is a question in the chat that I'd like to address first. Um, it's mm -hmm. about this, <laughs> this loon that we've been hearing so much about that's stuck down in Virginia. Um, oh God. And so, <laughs> yeah, so there's a loon on a small pond in Virginia right now. Um, and, you know, folks are just really concerned about it and, you know, not sure if it's, staying there because the fishing is good or if it's staying there because the pond is too small and it can't take off. Um, so uh, just wanted to say that, you know, we are aware of it. We've been consulting, Mark's been consulting and there's a whole sort of network of people keeping an eye on this loon and um, yeah, ready to advise or, you know, help help the, the local authorities or whoever might be able to respond. Um, should that become necessary? But the, the question specifically is saying, what are some things mm -hmm. we should look for to, you know, indicate that this loon does need us to step in? Yeah. Um, well, and, yeah. and let me, before you get into that, let me just put in a plug here for LPC as an information source in that, um, you know, between Carolyn and John Cooley and some of our other loon associates, this one in Virginia is getting all the press, but we've had, you know, stranded loons in small ponds in, in where Alabama, Tennessee, um, one in Arizona, just south of Sedona, wasn't that last week? Um, yeah. So, you know, it happens seasonally, in, particularly in migration, all over the US and Canada, and having institutions like LPC that have the knowledge and the expertise to respond to the public here is just incredibly valuable. Hmm. Yeah, yeah you, so as, <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mark. <laughs> um, as for those signs of, you know, if this loon is definitely in need of a rescue, um, I would say if it starts to beach itself, that's always a very bad sign. Um, for now, you know, we're, we're seeing photos of this loon getting off, you know, taking off, it's 10 feet off the surface of the water and then it lands again. We're seeing pictures of its fishing. So at least we know it's not starving right now, right? And uh, it, it mm -hmm. might not end up getting to where it wants to go, but probably it's not in any immediate danger. Um, yeah, I think the best call is just to, to keep monitoring for now and, and, and see what happens. Hopefully it will get off. I know there were some concerns that there was a fountain on this lake that might be impeding uh, the loon's takeoff. And so folks have gotten in touch with the people who run that fountain and gotten it turned off. Mm -hmm. um, and so now I think it's, it's a little bit of a waiting game, just keeping an eye on it and, and seeing how things progress, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I would imagine, I mean, and we've had loons come down in small ponds in, in New Hampshire as well. And of course, the issue here is that loons are a heavy bodied bird with relatively small wings. And, and so they have a very high uh, wing loading. So um, a loon, every, so essentially every square inch of a loon's wing has to hold aloft more body weight than almost any other flying bird in North America. I think that they're, they're second only to the swans in terms of their wing loading. And that just means that these loons have to have a long runway um, along the surface of the of the water to get enough airflow over those little wings to lift that heavy body off of the water. And if they come down in a pond that's too small, um, you know, it, they could they could have some some issues um, in becoming airborne again before they run out of water uh, to make that watery runway. But I think what we have found in many cases is that loons are smart, so they'll orient into the wind. <laughs> Um, and it may just be that they, they need a good stiff headwind uh, one day in order to be able to uh, get just enough of that extra lift to be able to clear that pond edge. So we'll see what happens. Well, you know, Harry, I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought that up because another example of that sort of thing, and again, this is one where I know LPC was consulted, is last winter when there was a lot of snow, um, you got a call, and I know you talked to the Avian Haven group in Maine about a loon that had landed in a farmer's field in, mm. in some deep snow. It had come down in a storm or something. And the people were gonna go out and rescue it. And the wind came up. <laughs> and at the wind, you know, this is the main coastal wind. As the wind started howling, that loon started dashing across the top of the snow and got airborne and away. You know, and Avian Haven went out and documented the tracks in the snow and there was no water. You know, right. loons can't do that very often, but if the wind gets up right. enough, 
I've heard oh. of uh, on an odd occasion. I mean, Jeff Fair, who is who used to be LPC's director, is now in sure. Alaska. I remember hearing a story from him to that same effect. Then on a really yeah. windy day and a snowy uh, thing, so there may be just enough lowered friction, you know, or or yeah. in that steep snow that they can get that yeah. traction and that running and, and things happen. So yeah. it's certainly um, it's a it's the exception rather than the rule, but I guess it can happen. I agree. Yeah. But, I'll add one more. Yeah. Oh, yeah. sorry, Mark. No, it's just, you know, the animals surprise us. Right. And we have to be open minded and, and, you know, learn from what they do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what makes biology so much more interesting than chemistry, right? Or something like that. Because you're dealing with living things and you've yeah. got that, that variability. And the one thing I've learned to, you know, to, to say, it, I've learned not to say, well, you, the one thing you'll never see loons do is this, because invariably they go ahead and do that very thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah. over the years, we, we, I have to learn to couch my terms a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I'll just add one more anecdote onto that <laughs> collection, which is that two winters ago now, John Cooley and I got a call about a loon that was stranded up on Lake Francis in, uh, you know, a, a 10 foot diameter hole in the ice. And so we loaded up, oh we drove the five hours up there. Um, and right as we were getting to the woman's house who had reported it, she said, you just missed it. A strong wind came and it took off. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. So again, they can make it work in a pinch. <laughs> yep. That's a good result though, right? We'll take that. Yes, absolutely. Yep. <laughs> um, okay. So we are at 801. If you guys don't mind hanging on for just a couple more minutes, um, there was one question that actually came in a couple times. So I um, wanted to make sure we got to it. And that is, um, you know, that loons are, really cool and and like a lot of other migratory water birds um cool in that they transition from salt water to fresh water um and and a lot of folks are are pretty amazed by that and are wondering you know what are the adaptations that help them make that transition um mark i know you had some slides prepared on that with illustrations of you know at least one of yeah, those I adaptations mean, yeah so. i've got i've got i've got one slide that i can show but let We'll see if we can sort of um, summarize this. I mean, if you look at vertebrates, you know, everything, fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals, every vertebrate on earth has to figure out how its body, and when I say figure out, not thoughtfully, evolutionarily, figure out how to handle salt in the environment because too much salt toxic. Um, and there are different ways to do it. You know, fish can do it through their gills. They can, some can do it through their skin. And, but mammals are the only group where many species of mammals have kidneys that can handle the salt by themselves. You and I can't, we can have salt poisoning, but many species of mammals, marine mammals, even dogs and cats, their kidneys are efficient enough to handle salt. Birds can't, they can't use their kidneys to do that. So if you think about marine reptiles like sea turtles, or if you think about birds, they have to have something other than their kidneys to help moderate salt. And these are called salt glands. And, you know, but, but, I mean, many people would say that birds are just, you know, a subgroup of reptiles anyway. We all saw Jurassic Park and, you know, mm -hmm. e modern evolutionary theory. So let me do the share screen and bring up one slide. Um, whoop, come on. There we go. No. All right. So this is a diagram from the textbook. Clearly that's not a loon, it's an albatross. But there's something here called the salt gland or supraorbital gland. Supraorbital means above the eye. And what you see down here at the bottom, this is a dead loon. You're looking down at the top of the head and I've peeled the skin back. And so you can see the beak is over here. The neck muscles are over here. The white is the bones of the skull, but you see these two they, they look, they're sort of meat colored. These two things that are sort of J-shaped or C-shaped, those are the salt glands. So they're under the skin, on top of the head, above the eyes, in albatrosses and loons. And, and most, in fact, most birds have salt glands, except for songbirds. There are no songs that I know of that have salt glands. And so what happens seasonally, when the birds are in New Hampshire in the summer, they're drinking fresh water. And, and these salt glands, they atrophy. It's like, you know, if, if you're lying in bed for a long time, your muscles atrophy and, and 
they get smaller and your arms get thinner and things. And it's, it's that use it or lose it kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And so if you catch a loon in the summertime and you feel the top of its head, these glands are sunken in, they've atrophied. But when the bird goes back out into the ocean and the salt level in its blood goes up, and that's what these glands detect. The glands detect how much sodium chloride is in the bird's blood. And as the sodium chloride goes up in the fall, these glands hypertrophy, and it doesn't happen overnight, it takes a couple of weeks. Mm. And they then pull the salt out of the blood and it drips down, it, there's a little duct, and then it drips out the nostrils and off the tip of the beak. Mm. And they get rid of the extra salt that way. And all of you have probably been on the beach, you've seen a, a gull standing on a post, herring gull, blackback gull, ringbill gull, whatever gull it is. And you'll see every once in a while, a little drip of water come off the tip of its beak. Uh. That's a hypersaline solution. It's a concentrated salt solution coming out of these salt glands that the birds are using. It's kind of like an extra kidney to get mm. rid of the, and it just does sodium chloride. And if you really want to know, there's a lot of physiologic literature on this, but we don't need to go into that tonight. Uh. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, I think we're um, at the end of our time and, and at the end of our questions. So um, thank you so much, Harry and Mark, for being here and, and you know contributing so much to this talk. And thank you to everyone who attended and asked questions. And I hope that uh, you know we were able to answer your questions uh, to your satisfaction. All right. Thank, thank you, Mark, for all that you do for our Loon Preservation Committee and for Loons, including um, tonight. Um, and thank you as well, Caroline. For, yep. for, exactly, yes, we make a good team, don't we, right? So uh, thank you, Caroline, for uh, moderating and jumping in to answer some questions and for putting on this series as well. So I hope we'll be doing more of these in the future. Yes. Great. Thank you. All Great. right. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks all. Thanks a lot.